Hello and welcome. We are Team 12 and our presentation is on the system inertia impact due to high renewable penetration, the Texas Interconnection, also known as the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. We are your presenters. I am Salvador. I'm Justin. I'm Gonzalo. I'm Arnuvia. I'm Jeremiah. And I will start us off with the introduction. Uh, so we will begin first with, um, with some study objectives. For phase one, we modify a 2017 model of the ERCOT grid to reflect the 2045 projection. For phase two, determine the maximum threshold of renewable energy penetration on the 2045 peak model. For phase three, ensure the threshold is effective in an off-peak model. After, we conduct an analysis to ensure stability in phases two and three, then short circuit duty through, through phases. And finally, estimate total cost of transmission related improvements. So it's no secret the world is moving towards green energy and the US is no different. We are transitioning away from non-renewables like coal and natural gas and into renewables like wind and solar. These graphs illustrate the transitioning into renewable energy. According to the US Energy Information Administration, renewable energy generation nearly doubled from 382 million to 742 million megawatt hours in only 10 years. 90% of this growth came from solar and wind alone. So is there an issue with rapid growth in renewables? With increasing renewable energy comes a problem of inertia. Inertia comes from the ro rotating turbines found in traditional generation. It acts as a buffer when load and generation levels are unbalanced. The blue line shows system frequency reaction during a fault when there is high levels of inertia in the system. The red light shows with medium levels of inertia in the system, and the green line shows the lowest levels of inertia in the system. As you can see, the lower your inertia levels, the more drastic your rate of change of frequency or Rokoff. So relating renewables to Texas, here is a map of the solar irradiance in Texas, and it shows the potential for solar generation to be more in the far west and panhandle regions. Here, this map shows the average wind speed of Texas, and it shows the best potential for wind generation to be in the panhandle and coast areas. So onto the agenda, we will be talking about pre-existing grid conditions, the study scenario and assumptions, then phase one results, after phase two and phase three results, and finally short circuit duty and cost estimate. To start us off with the pre-existing grid conditions will be Gonzalo. Okay, so uh, we did our work in PowerWorld. We used a student version of the 2017 ERCOT grid. Uh, here's a picture of the ERCOT's weather regions map. Points of inches are north central and south central on the coast. This is where Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, Austin, and Houston are, the most uh, populated centers in Texas. Other points of inches are the north and far west. Uh, these areas have the highest amount of wind speed and solar radiance primed for renewable generation. So here are the values of the 2017 base case. Looking at the load table, you can see north central, south central and the coast have the highest amount of load. This is because these are the most populated areas. Looking at the generation table, north central, south central and the coast match them, you know, load to match generation. Other points of interest are the far west, north and the west. These areas have the lowest amount of generation, making them prime for uh, solar panels and wind turbines. Next slide, please. And Jeremiah will go over the study scenarios and assumptions. Thank you, Gonzalo. So uh, as Sal mentioned in our study, we have three different phases of uh, work. And so I'm just going to be outlining what exactly the scenarios and assumptions we're making for each of those phases are. So phase one is getting from the 2017 base case to the 2045 uh, projected uh, case. And so in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is find out what the uh, peak demand is in 2045 in ERCOT. So some of the work was done here by ERCOT as they have planning reports that project peak demand up to 2030. Uh, and in their studies, they found uh, an average annual growth rate of 0.9% uh, for peak demand from 2011 to 2020. And then they forecasted an AAGR of 1.2% from 2021 to 2030. And so we noticed there was a 0.3% increase in AAGR between those two nine-year periods. And so we went ahead and decided to just roll those over into the next two nine-year periods. So 1.5% from 2031 to 2040 and 1.8% from 2041 to 2050. And so when we made these projections and plotted the results, we found that the peak demand in 2045 was uh, 108,889 megawatts or around 109 gigawatts. <clears throat> uh, 
Using the formula below with the starting value that Gonzalo gave us for uh, the total load in the base case and this value that we calculated, uh, we find a total load increase in peak demand of about 62%. Just some caveats to go over in this projection. Uh, these planning reports that ERCOT publish, uh, they're published uh, annually, and every year they get better and better with more and more forecasting models uh, showing different situations. So for example, electric vehicles, they are included in this projection, uh, but not in an actual forecasted model as ERCOT hasn't developed one for them yet. Instead, it's a frozen forecast in which they use historical data from 2015 to 2020 to project into the future. And so electric vehicles and distributed solar and those sorts of things are included in the projection, but uh, they're using frozen forecasts for some of those. As far as our modification guidelines, like how we were going to get from that 2017 uh, starting point to the 2045 condition, we established that there's going to be a 62% load increase. And uh, we went ahead and figured that we were going to need 48 gigawatts of generation to serve that load increase. And we did that by looking at the difference between total load and generation capacity in the base case and matching the gap between that. And once again, to match that same gap, we need about 48 gigawatts. Uh, the generation additions we're making were going to be renewable energy only, solar and wind, and they're going to be 250 megawatt capacity uh, solar and wind generators, and for battery energy storage units, 150 megawatt capacity. The placement of these was all going to be determined by land and resource availability. So what we mean by that is when we're talking about resource availability, you know, we could refer back to the maps that uh, Sal showed earlier in the introduction. So that's in terms of uh, where high levels of solar irradiance and where high wind speeds are located. And then in terms of land availability, we used a guide published by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and we found that for a 250 megawatt capacity uh, wind farm and solar farm, you would need 20 square miles and two square miles respectively. So we use those as guidelines in terms of, should we put solar here, should we put wind here, or if the land isn't available, do we put a battery energy storage unit here? And another thing that we use for reference was uh, this map from the 2020 ERCOT long-term system planning report in which they modeled uh, where renewable energy could be developed in the future in different scenarios. And so the scenario we referred to was the current trend scenario, which is just uh, projecting what we know now in terms of how we're going to be expanding the transmission system and, you know, different developments coming in ERCOT. So we reference these maps. Uh, for phase two, for our projection, or for phase two, in order to find our uh, maximum renewable energy penetration threshold, the uh, modification we were making here was basically retiring non-renewable generators and just opening them up in power world um, and just maximizing the amount of renewable energy here. So we, de we decommissioned units that ERCOT has pre-designated for retirement up to 2030 and we replaced them with wind or solar generation or battery energy storage units depending on the land availability and what the situation was. Um, and then we conducted stability analysis to see if the system stabilized, if it did, we continued with these retirements, uh, getting more and more non-renewable generation off the case and more and more renewable and battery uh, generation onto the case until it reached a point where system frequency and voltage broke down. Uh, Justin will go into more detail uh, later to describe what that looks like exactly. And so then once we reached that point, we knew that we had our maximum renewable energy penetration threshold. And so recall that that is going on, those modifications are going on in a peak version of the case. The peak version of the case is, you know, during a summer month around probably between 5 to 9 p.m. when peak demand is the highest. Uh, so we wanted to go ahead and also make sure that that amount of renewable energy could support an off-peak version of the case, which would be in the winter at about 2 a.m. And so because it's happening at night and this, we're assuming that all solar generation is off the case because there's no sun. Uh, there is less demand because it's in the middle of the night, less people are awake, so we reduced load to 40%. And then one thing to take note of is we also, not only do we lose the solar generation, but we also lose the battery energy storage generation because these do have to be charged, usually in off-peak hours. So now all these batteries, all these batteries that we added in phase one and phase two are going to be converted into loads. So that's going to increase the demand because we're going to be charging them. Those are the assumptions we're going in to the off-peak case with. And now to talk about the results from the 2045 uh, phase one modification is going to be our new view. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, starting off with a uh, generation, our target was to add about 43 gigawatts, but in actuality, we added about 58 gigawatts of solar and wind generation. 
Uh, this difference of 15 gigawatts from our projector value was due to contingency events that happen while making load additions and also there were more transmission lines overload than low bus voltage violations than expected. Therefore, we had to make uh, this necessary um, extra additions to offset those issues. Um, next slide, please. As for um, batteries, if an area was experiencing uh, violations and transmission overloads and it was not feasible to add solar or wind generation due to land or limited renewable resources, the battery energy storage device were added. To balance out the load increase in large metropolitan areas like Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, which are in the north central, south central, and coast regions, we added a total of 21 gigawatts of battery storage, which aligns with the 18 uh, gigawatts that ERCA has queued up to add to the interconnection in the future. Um, when doing all these modifications, we encounter many thermal overloads and bus voltage uh, violations in which sometimes it would trigger a system blackout, which uh, the picture above illustrates it uh, to accommodate some of those uh, thermal overloads and bus voltage violations. We added some transmission lines and transformers. Uh, we added a total of 441 transformers, which 32 of them were due to overloads. As for transmission lines, there was a total of 82 added, which 30 of them were due to overloads. And we also added batteries to help out with their thermal overloads and bus voltage issues. Um, the figure here was pulled out from the 2020 LTSA report, and it shows ERCOC's planned transmission of grids, with we, which we use as a guideline when adding new transmission lines. Using the figure, we justify that from the 82 lines that we added, 21 of them are either existing high voltage lines that were not included in our student version of the case, or as lines that were planned to be um, add it in the next 15 years. Next slide, please. The following figures um, show the before and after state of the transmission system in Power Row. The figure to the left is the transmission system before any modifications were done. Um, the one to the right is the current state in which all modifications were added. Thank you. And Justin will take over for stability analysis. So to make sure everything works, we also have to make sure that our system is stable in the event of fault or sudden loss of generation. As you can see with this visual, uh, as soon as you lose a decent amount of generation, immediately frequency is going to drop. Uh, this is proportional to the amount of inertia left on the system, uh, normally in natural gas and coal units. And if there's not enough and it dipped below 59.3 hertz, we go into under frequency load shedding, uh, essentially forced blackouts. So to test this, we found critical buses across our system where we applied faults. These were buses with high amounts of generation, and we monitored this through monitoring buses just dotted around um, the ERCOT system to represent what's happening as a whole. So this is an example of a blackout, something we don't want happening. You'll see reds at the fault and then Afterwards, you'll see the entire system taken over by a deep blue, which is what we really don't want. Awesome. So we found a maximum penetration threshold for renewable energy to be at 71% coming from renewables. This gave us a nice 0.1 hertz reliability margin. So we were 0.1 hertz away from 59.3, which was um, our danger zone. And it converged nicely after a little bit. So we see visual starts off green, then the fault's gonna hit, you're gonna see some oscillations, and then it's gonna go back to green and stabilize. <clears throat> so again, we'll see this, but with voltage, so the, the fault's gonna hit at 10 seconds, then it's going to stabilize and our system will be good. So 
tells you some oscillations, and then it goes back to relative normalcy. So what happens if you go above that 71% threshold? At just 5% more, 76%, we see major, major oscillations, and uh, at the fall of 10 seconds, we see under-frequency load shedding, which is very undesirable. Then we'll go into a visual. Starts off a nice light blue, everything's normal, and then we have bad news. And the case is taken over by essentially a shutdown. Same thing, voltage, 76% threshold. There's a lot of oscillations that just don't seem to be dampening. We'll see that again. We'll see changes in color. Yes, you'll see it won't just stay with uh, the green. And for phase three, I'll leave to Jeremiah. Thank you, Justin. So now that we established the uh, renewable energy penetra penetration threshold is 71% in phase two, the next thing we needed to do is just make sure that this could uh, sustain uh, an off-peak version of the case. So not even looking at transient stability yet, but just looking at the steady state uh, scenario of the case, uh, right away there's an issue. <clears throat> so we lose all our solar generation because this is happening at nighttime, remember? We're calling this around 2 a.m. And uh, we have reduced the amount of non-renewable energy in our case. And all we have left really is that and uh, the wind power that we've put in while doing retirements and getting our case to the 2045 version in phases one and two. And then whatever, you know, hydro and nuclear power that we had in the case. So we have 78 gigawatts of generation. This is an issue because it's not enough to serve the total demand in the case. So even though we reduced demand by 40%, which comes down to 44 gigawatts, we still have to account for this battery load, this load that we have to charge in order to have the batteries ready to operate during the peak case in that phase two. So we end up having 39 gigawatts of battery load, which was put in while we were making our modifications in phase one and two when getting to the 2045 condition and making our retirements. And so in order to combat this, we decided to do a staggered charging scheme in which we would only charge about half of the batteries at once. And uh, this would be good because then we could balance our resources. And in order to demonstrate that that was effective, when we ran our transient stability analysis, we saw that there was no underfrequency load shedding. The graphs did converge, you know, frequency converged, and uh, the system was able to stay stable using this char uh, staggered charging scheme. When we didn't use a staggered charging scheme, there was just you know, mass instability. And so you do see fluctuations here in major load centers, but for the most part, the system does return back to normal and is stable. You'll see the same thing with voltage. We see response to the fault, we see a little oscillation afterwards, and then we see convergence and stability restored back to the system. We can see this here again in this visual, a fault is applied. There's a bit of oscillation going around a uh, little bit of high bus voltage, low bus voltage, but for the most part, the entire system remains at around one per unit, which is what we want. I'm going to pass it back to Justin to go over the short circuit duty analysis results uh, through the phases of the work. So when we measured the short circuit current uh, throughout the phases, we found that between phases two and three, the retirements, uh, there is a difference of, uh, there's a major difference in short circuit duty. In the coast, south central, north central, we'll see like lower short circuit currents. And due to this, ERCOT may need to pay attention to protection elements, changing parameters, and also to uh, inverter parameters. Thank you, Justin. And finally, the uh, last portion of our study was a cost estimate to try to figure out just how much our transmission system expansions would uh, cost. So in order to do this, we used an exploratory cost estimate uh, published in a guide by MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. And uh, MISO defined this cost estimate as being a good one to use for a project with a wide scope and definition, which ours is since it goes far into the future and there's a lot of variables that we can't predict or uh, see coming. So our total study cost for our transmission improvements came out to $8.6 billion throughout all three phases of our study. Uh, for reference, this is pretty close to a trans current transmission expansion costs in ERCOT. Uh, ERCOT recently uh, put in competitive renewable energy zone or CRES lines in order to move renewable energy uh, from low demand centers to high demand centers. 
And those lines cost them about $7 billion. So our cost comes, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more than that, uh, but it's very close and it goes very far into the future, uh, you know, with some pretty massive expansions. So just to recap and conclude uh, the findings of our study, in phase one, we found that the 2045 projected peak demand in ERCOT would reach about 109 gigawatts. In phase two, we established that uh, there could be a 71% renewable energy penetration uh, threshold in our case. And in phase three, we established in order for that to work in an off-peak version of the case, we would need to have a staggered charging scheme uh, where about you know half of the batteries are being charged from maybe 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. and the other half are being charged from maybe 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Now, we also saw there was a significant decrease in short circuit current in some major load centers. Uh, so protection elements may have to be updated in ERCOT if uh, this, you know, the improvements are going to be made in the way that we did it. And we do see uh, reductions like this. And uh, overall, our transmission improvements cost about $8.6 billion. So thank you for uh, watching this presentation and attending our lecture. Uh, we'd like to make some acknowledgments just to finish up. We'd like to thank our advisor, Professor Saman, for uh, just being really fantastic uh, and just extremely helpful in guiding us through this whole process. We'd like to thank Dr. Thorburn for uh, running a really great uh, capstone program. And we'd like to thank everyone at IT, Yin, Ken, and Fernando. We did this project completely remotely, and it would not have been possible without the help of IT. So thank you all, and uh, stay safe. <laughs>